These are the results of Craig Johnson's Panzer Leader Peleleo simulation. In an earlier video, we covered the rules and the procedures, and here we're going to look at the results. We ran the simulation for a full day with a team of students uh, embarking the units and then landing them on the beach. We explore here the implications of those rules for Panzerblitz, which is a system that we also used to simulate the Russian and Ukrainian interaction in the ongoing conflict in the Ukraine, ultimately uh, for the purpose to come up with what uh, we thought was the best system to model a Chinese landing in Taiwan, uh, which is going to be uh, the uh, final subject of our discussion. This was the original layout. You can see the Japanese are deployed as historical, and you can see two of the uh, Marine regiments off to the top left. Second Battalion uh, of the uh, 2nd Infantry uh, Regiment uh, deployment. Forces as deployed in entrenchments. Third Battalion of the 5th Infantry Regiment. Deployment in the entrenchments. The historical deployment of Japanese in the interior around the airfield, including the Japanese tank battalion that uh, you can catch the depiction of their counteroffensive in the HBO movie The Pacific. This shows the deployment of troops in the entrenchments along the beachfront. These are the cave fortifications that were dug in by the Japanese in the Umurbergal Mountains, which are uh, actually a coral mountains that rise up to 100 meters uh, high. The uh, fortifications were ultimately uh, destroyed after two months of fighting. Each hex here is 250 meters, so you can imagine this whole defense complex was less than two kilometers wide. Now in the game, it takes probably an hour to destroy each of these fortifications. They can't be struck by indirect fire in the form of naval artillery or aircraft, although aircraft, when they drop napalm in conjunction with naval explosives or indirect artillery fire that includes HE, will strip away the uh, jungle coverage, uh, removing uh, one of the negative die roll modifiers to attack the facility. But the only way to attack the K fortifications is to direct fire, typically, uh, infantry uh, marine units plus uh, direct fire artillery, which is of course vulnerable and exposed when it's uh, brought adjacent um, to these targets for destruction. Now there are 12 fortifications in this simulation. It takes about an hour of game time to destroy each in terms of approaching the target, uh, uh, hitting it in order to uh, uh, suppress it in the more form of dispersion and then attacking it and hoping to get a double dispersion result in order to uh, have units uh, eliminated under the uh, cave marker. Historically, however, it took an average of five days to destroy each of these markers, which logically, if you extrapolate, it took two months uh, to secure uh, just this um, uh, fortified area. So uh, Panzer Leader Paleo is not a very good uh, simulation of the technical uh, approach to removing uh, uh, fortified uh, uh, coral caves, but it is good for the logistics of, of doing a marine landing. The Japanese uh, troops deployed in an isthmus uh, that leads to Negasegas uh, Island. The deployment of the entrenched troops. Here you can see the forces on Negasabus Island. This airfield was ultimately uh, useless because it was too soft. Uh, so this is the uh, fortifications uh, that we saw earlier in the Umarbergal Mountains. These are the forces deployed there. So you have an equivalent of a company under each of the counters and they include a variety of forces like communications, maintenance, medical, supply, uh, up until uh, the last few days of the conflict, there was a buried uh, landline leading to an undersea cable uh, that allowed the Japanese to communicate continuously with the uh, headquarters located on an island um, uh, north in this uh, archipelago. 
So we had a full day simulation, including about an hour and a half to deploy a Marine division in three regiments, the 1st, 5th, and 7th Regiment, by platoons and sections into all its transport vehicles. Ultimately, we got two and a half regiments in their vehicles, and we simulated from the beginning of the arrival of the units on the map edge, which is about uh, two kilometers uh, from the shore, until their landing and um, entry about half a kilometer inland uh, about 90 minutes later. And this took us a full day. So initially there was a, a bombardment of the shore because the Japanese had mined the shore and a combination of uh, air attacks and naval bombardment reduced the mine threat. Uh, the mine threat was uh, further reduced by engineers on the shore that uh, swept the beaches. You can see uh, the students organizing on the edge of the map the different landing systems. Uh, you could lift about uh, a regiment uh, and a third uh, at a time, uh, not including uh, other logistics, which, which are the platoon scale of supplies that have to be landed every turn, or the equivalent, equivalent of every five minutes uh, for each of the battalions. So this is a close-up of the initial bombardment. Uh, any Japanese forces that were located uh, on a hex with forest or with buildings uh, could uh, not be spotted. And so this is speculative fire. So this is the initial wave, uh, mostly in LVTs, landing vehicle uh, tracks. The uh, stick there uh, indicates the division between the different uh, Marine regiments. The fire markers indicate the pre-registered uh, Japanese artillery fire, which wasn't substantial, uh, on the very edge of the um, coral. So the logic is to capture the Marines as they get stuck, if they get stuck. But you can see the Marines here have already deployed their engineers and are preparing the coral reefs for the, for the different type of landing vehicles that cannot cross the reef alone. So this is a, a few more uh, turns in. Uh, you can see one of the Marine regiments has begun uh, landing on the shore and pulling back their vehicles. You can see uh, further landing and the various Japanese entrenchments uh, become known uh, once the Marines come into contact with them while trying to move through their hexes. And again, you can see at this point uh, fully two Marine regiments uh, have landed. Now, historically, they landed all three regiments at the same time, except they held back one battalion from each of the regiments. So this was a chart that recorded, uh, for, for the equivalent of the first 60 minutes of the landing, those platoons that had been destroyed by the Japanese. Now, non-platoon losses in the forms of uh, artillery and LVTs and LCVPs uh, were not put here, uh, and they were much higher. These units uh, were put here because they show you the decrease in uh, collective morale for that company of that battalion of that regiment. And so you can see the uh, second battalion of the first regiment and the third battalion of the seventh regiment received, uh, you know, quite heavy losses. And so this would have an impact on uh, the ability of the unit to operate because most of these units attack. Uh, based off the synergenic uh, training they have of uh, certain companies moving and others uh, firing for uh, suppression. And that's lost when you have very high casualties. So what are the implications of this? Now, the purpose of uh, running the simulation was obviously to use the Panzerblitz Panzerleader system because it nicely aggregates values and allows you to treat different platoons. Um, to try to envision solving different kinds of uh, tactical problems. So the first uh, test of concept for uh, Panzerblitz in a China-Taiwan contingency was to see if uh, we could get some sense of uh, validity in having uh, relative uh, balances between units uh, and, and then seeing if that reflects what we expect to be 
the casualty rates and uh, the movement uh, of units uh, across geography that we see in the real world. So we took um, from Camelot Games uh, counters that had been prepared reflecting the Ukrainian and the Russian forces currently fighting uh, in the Ukraine. Now these values are consistent with the progression from Panzerblitz to uh, Panzer Leader to Arab-Israeli wars and then subsequently a lot of uh, fan contributions about the relative power of the different systems. So if uh, um, someone had played uh, Panzer Leader, they might recall that a typical M4 Sherman had a nine attack value. So here you can see a T-80 uh, with an attack value of 28, which is about three, to three, the equivalent of three separate Shermans. And a T-80 UD has got a, a defense in terms of armor of 39, where a Sherman's got about an eight. So, you know, this gives you the idea that the uh, T-80 is worth about five Shermans in defense and three Shermans in attack. And permitting the Shermans to get mobility hits. In other words, uh, the 75 millimeter gun hitting the track of the T-80 and there, thereby disabling its ability to move. You know, that's, that's possible. But uh, if you were to compare the combat in another system like MBT, uh, where you're looking at different angles of attack from uh, an armor piercing or uh, an armor piercing just scouting Sabo round, uh, or, or a heat round against uh, an, a, a different parts of the armor on an armored vehicle, you're probably never going to get a, a 75 millimeter round from a Sherman penetrating the frontal armor of a T-80. And then you're gonna get the type of ratios that you see between uh, M1 tanks fighting T-62s that Tom Clancy depicted in Red Storm Rising, where you've got a platoon of M1s at a Ford, uh, essentially defeating an entire brigade of uh, uh, T-62s and T-55s that are trying to, to cross uh, that stream. So uh, Panzer Blitz and Panzer Leader have their limitations. They're, it's it's useful to uh, envision specialized units and how they're used, uh, but you need other game systems um, to measure up individual vehicles and then to build them up in ratios uh, against other uh, systems. So I'm not sure the numbers here are valid uh, longitudinally against earlier um, measurements of, say, German Second World War and, and Soviet Second World War uh, armor, uh, but it does, it does seem that you've got some decent validity between the Ukrainians and the Russians, in particular because offense and defense on the units are relatively well matched and the Ukrainians and uh, Russian tanks in terms of their attack values uh, differentiate in, in ways that um, uh, is, is shown to be relatively true in the literature. So these are uh, additional counters that came in the, uh, the Camelot Games uh, Ukraine-Russia counter set. So these were organized into uh, separate uh, battalions. We have um, for the Russians, um, we've got three uh, brigades here and uh, we've got um, one uh, uh, air portable uh, company. Uh, these are two other brigades. So you're looking at a division and a half uh, forces. Uh, you can see uh, at the bottom uh, Wagner with their various uh, mercenaries, including the uh, convicts who were serving in exchange for uh, a com com commutation of their sentence. So these are the Ukrainian uh, brigades, including artillery uh, and more Ukrainian brigades. You can see in the top left, uh, it also included the Bayraktar uh, drone and as well as other attack drones. So uh, we gathered students and we uh, uh, got various uh, Panzer Blitz and Panzer Leader and Arab Israeli war maps. They didn't dis uh, uh, accurately depict the type of open terrain that you have in Ukraine. But if you look at the built up terrain uh, and the broken terrain around uh, Kharkiv and uh, Kiev uh, and near the Donetsk, it does sort of work. 
so uh, each student took a different brigade, and we um, had the Russians advance on the Ukrainians. We could explore issues like the effectiveness of artillery, uh, the utility of drones, uh, and sort of space and time movement, and how vulnerable vehicles were uh, to minefield effects. So again, this is the uh, conduct of the uh, war game. Uh, one of the key things we're interested in, obviously, at the time was Bakhmut, and so uh, we took the existing urban terrain and enlarged it. Uh, retrospectively, we didn't have anywhere uh, the density of infantry that was actually deployed by the Ukrainians in Bakhmut, and our, our version of Bakhmut really ended up being a, sort of a screening operation uh, and partially a meeting engagement uh, with uh, relieving forces coming from the Ukrainians. So here, the operations were very, very tank heavy and demonstrated a level of uh, combined operations that are, are not actually being practiced by the Ukrainians or the Russians, where generally the different combat arms like artillery, tanks, and infantry uh, are used in sequence, where in this game, uh, you know, we, we uh, were generous in the level of command coordination that the Russians and the Ukrainians were able to achieve. Well, the implication of the simulation in uh, Peleleo and the Ukraine-Russia uh, Panzer Blitz model is that uh, China's landing has to be a landing that is logistically feasible and allows it to deploy fire firepower quickly enough that it can't be stopped just on the shore of that territory. So considering the different parts of uh, Taiwan, although it's politically expedient for China to capture Taipei right off at the beginning of a conflict, because Taipei and New Taipei, which is sort of a donut-shaped city that uh, uh, occupies the rest of the flat land around old Taipei, contains about half of uh, uh, Taiwan's entire population. However, this is uh, not a very safe place to land because you, you simply don't have a large number of ports that can be used on the scale that China would need to bring in follow-on uh, supplies uh, for its armored units as well as the very large quantity of supplies for its artillery. Furthermore, you've got a donut of mountains around uh, Taipei that are uh, tactically very difficult to penetrate. Even if China were to use air mobile and paratroopers to try to capture some of the infrastructure, most of the infrastructure is easily uh, destroyed by demolitions. Uh, furthermore, any landing uh, near Taipei would be enfiladed by U.S. aircraft operating out of Okinawa. And if not Okinawa, because Okinawa is close to uh, sh the uh, Chinese air bases in Shanghai and could be neutralized, uh, then at least uh, U.S. aircraft operating off of carriers or out of uh, Kyushu, uh, Japan. So it's a very, very uh, risky landing. Although some people have modeled it and shown that uh, the Chinese forces can advance uh, with with fair speed, uh, because this you know it's an old map, and the the red circle I've driv I've drawn around Taipei is, is, is today the urban area, uh, which you know are buildings anywhere between five and fifty stories high. Uh, it's a very difficult environment uh, to penetrate, and you're not going to get a speedy action because of the density of defenders um, that Taiwan has in that area. There is. Um, very unlikely going to be any landing on the uh, east coast of Taiwan. Most of the coast is rocky and completely inaccessible. There's only about five mountain passes, most of which have no tunnels at all, that go through the mountains uh, to the uh, western side of, of Taiwan. Uh, most of the uh, increases in altitude for these uh, mountain roads, uh, they'll achieve um, uh, 3,200 meter uh, heights uh, in very, very short distances, like 20 or 30 kilometers. Uh, they are passable by truck if you've got military police there uh, to ensure traffic keeps moving and you've got engineers dealing with uh, you know, what, what's expected to be constant damage uh, to the roads. But any uh, Chinese fleet operating on the east coast of uh, Taiwan is going to have their backs up against uh, that coast and are going to be vulnerable to any uh, U.S. Uh, anti-ship forces deployed within the 
um, the depths of the Pacific Ocean, let alone submarines. And anything, any troops they land, uh, because they'll be held in by the mountains, are not going to have an operational uh, or even tactical effect. They're, they're going to be uh, trapped there. This is a drone that was uh, immediately above our car as we were driving um, down the road uh, in uh, this particular area. Uh, very frequently modeled as an alternative to landing at Taipei is uh, Taiyuan. It's got a major airport. Uh, it's got a relatively flat, accessible beach. Uh, the terrain uh, is uh, broken because of aquaculture and rice farming, but you do have uh, major highways going through there. Uh, again, this is an old map, and so you can see the red line I've drawn, which represents the uh, built-up areas, the urban areas that uh, China would have to fight through. Again, the reason that uh, China would not want to land here is because it would be enfiladed by uh, U.S. aircraft operating from uh, bases in Japan. So uh, it, it would get Chinese forces to Taiwan quickly, but I, don't, I, I think it's a, a, a very, very risky place to land. So much of the uh, west coast of uh, Taiwan is mudflats that go out to two to three uh, kilometers. And this is the sort of high tide representation of that. Um, here, the mudflats are uh, not severe. Uh, so where you don't have mudflats, uh, you're going to get this uh, coastal uh, uh, protection made of large uh, cement blocks that uh, are useful. Um, for when the uh, ocean is uh, trying to uh, uh, pull the soil off the coast. But it's also a major impediment to any mechanized uh, landing that the Chinese would conduct. And although you do see sand here, this is a, a relatively small gap. And there are not that many uh, gaps like this on a beach that uh, China could exploit on a large scale. So this is uh, one of the uh, mud flats uh, at at high tide. So uh, you can see uh, individuals out there about uh, 20 meters and they're barely uh, two inches um, under the water. And so this goes very, very far out. Uh, now it's not a problem uh, for uh, some of the lighter Chinese vehicles that would land, but logistically it's very, very uh, difficult to bring uh, large loads of supplies across uh, that distance uh, without having to lay trackway uh, because the, the, the soil is going to get dis disrupted very, very quickly. And uh, this is, you know, again, it's a major industrial project to build a road on this kind of terrain. And a large part of the Taiwanese uh, west coast is characterized by this kind of terrain. So again, here you can see a uh, side view of what the terrain is. And this is, this is after uh, whatever forces have landed have covered the two or three kilometers of mud flats to this location. So you're going to get this uh, ac across a large stretches of the uh, Taiwanese coast. A major problem, of course, uh, for China is not only to land, but then to get resupplied. And there are large numbers of small fishing ports, um, but the vast majority of them cannot accommodate the landing of armored vehicles. Uh, uh, certainly not much more than one armored vehicle at a time. And so uh, they're good for landing raiders, uh, but you're, you're not going to be landing uh, even company-sized uh, organizations with their equipment and their, uh, their supplies. So they're, they're, they're not going to be able to uh, advance inland. Uh, this particular uh, section of the uh, west coast of Taiwan uh, would be especially problematic because you've got layers of mountains behind which you have the highway infrastructure, which gives Taiwan some uh, mobility to redeploy depending on where the Chinese land. Now, this is uh, Tainan, a city in the south. Craig Johnson and I were debating as to where the Chinese would conduct their landing. And this seemed like a logical uh, area. Um, there's a lot of port facilities here, again, uh, particularly a large one uh, just on the uh, coast. 
uh, in front of Tainan. And Tana Tainan's uh, urban geography, again, is, is represented by that red oval I drew because it's, it's grown significantly since this uh, map was published. And the, the Chinese could certainly uh, land there, but there's you know, infrastructure problems to then break out of Tainan to go north uh, or south. Now on this map you can see uh, the depiction of uh, Kaohsiung, which is uh, Taiwan's largest port. This is just south of Tainan. About 75% of the goods uh, imported and exported from Taiwan go through the port of Kaohsiung. However, there, there's now major uh, diversions to uh, Taizong Harbor, uh, which is farther to the north, uh, that I will uh, show uh, shortly. Uh, Craig Johnson and I um, speculated that a landing would most likely occur at Chikan Beach, north of Kaohsiung, as well as uh, to the south. Now, there might be raids and a direct uh, coup de main where the Chinese Marines would try to capture the port uh, directly, uh, but you've got uh, Taiwanese defenders in uh, downtown uh, Kaohsiung and in two large hills, one on the coast to the uh, north of uh, Kaohsiung and one to the south. And so there would be uh, a, a, a significant risk uh, for the uh, Chinese landing directly at the city, even though the payoff is to obtain a very, very large port. Now, uh, even, if the, even though the train is not prohibitive, the problem is now that the U.S. has air bases established in uh, Luzon, Philippines, uh, any Chinese landing here would be enfiladed uh, by the U.S. Air Force that would only have to fly about 400 kilometers. And so uh, China would suffer severe losses. It would be a very risky landing and one in which they would lose a lot of ships. Uh, this, this, uh, a landing here would require China to do some sort of neutralization of the U.S. air bases on Luzon, perhaps by actually landing Marines on Luzon uh, in Langayan Gulf like the Japanese did uh, during the Second World War. Uh, the U.S. at that time had B-17 bombers under uh, Army uh, Air Force General uh, Curtis LeMay, whose instructions were to bomb uh, Japan the moment the Second World War broke out. But his bomber force uh, was destroyed in a first strike uh, by the Japanese uh, at the same time as Pearl Harbor was being attacked. So this is some of the terrain uh, to the south of Kaohsiung. The water, water you see here is actually the mouth of a, the major river uh, that divides Kaohsiung from Bingtung, which is another uh, city. And you can see a continuance of this uh, lor littoral protection that the uh, Taiwanese have to deal with recurring storms uh, that secondarily is going to make any landing by the Chinese Marines and their uh, wheeled and tracked vehicles very difficult. So this is uh, some of that littoral um, in Chikan Beach, which is uh, north of Kaohsiung and south of Tainan. Now the uh, littoral uh, protection that Taiwan has against storms, those obstacles don't actually have a rebar reinforcement, even though they do have uh, ferrous frames that were used uh, to keep the um, uh, form uh, together when they were pouring the cement. However, um, demolishing with shaped charges all of these obstacles um, uh, uh, and creating an access wide enough is not going to be possible for uh, Chinese engineers if they're under uh, any form of fragmentation or high explosive artillery fire that's continuous. So uh, it, it is an industrial effort to clear out enough passages through these obstacles to be able to land a battalion or brigade sized units uh, with uh, its uh, mobility uh, um, of vehicles. So this is a Taizong and I speculate that if there is a landing in Taiwan it would be here and what this map doesn't show is uh, what is now Taiwan's second largest port uh, which actually extends uh, the full width between the uh, Tatu Tsi and the Takia Tsi, which are the two rivers to the north and south of uh, Taizong. Now, landing uh, um, here is, is nevertheless going to be difficult because even though you have a port, 
that can be used uh, to dock ships. The port itself is a major uh, cement built up defensible obstacle that would need to be captured. Furthermore, even if uh, China landed at uh, Taizong, while it wouldn't be enfiladed uh, as easily as a beach landing um, in Taoyuan in the north or Kaohsiung in the south, uh, the, they would then have to advance inland and you can see that Taizong is actually located behind a range of mountains that I drove through. I mean, essentially very steep hills, but nevertheless very, very uh, defensible. Uh, and even if the city was captured behind it, uh, you still have more infrastructure. So uh, it, it, it's not easy in, in any instance for China to capture any of the major cities in uh, Taiwan, except maybe uh, Tainan. Um, but its, its strategic location is the least uh, significant. So I think the uh, key takeaway for a simulation of an amphibious landing in Taiwan is to start by focusing on the logistics tactics and the individual values of the vehicles that you see in MBT. I'm a believer that even if the political authorities don't inform their strategy from the tactics of the units they're going to employ, which is essentially a measure of their power, then we can at least predict an outcome of a mismatched strategy with the resources available by comparing how Taiwanese and Chinese forces interact. Now, my students have run the Taiwan scenario more than any other scenario over the years, starting with the Joseph Miranda uh, uh, invasion Taipei that you can see in the center that came out in the late 1990s. And we ran that, uh, I believe, um, in the early 2000s, if not, you know, if not 2000 and 2001. And unlike the uh, GMT version, it looks at media impacts and information warfare and um, the impact that has on alliance strategies. Now for the uh, GMT game, uh, which is good for an operational level, and you're looking at uh, half a week a turn and eight kilometers to the hex, it's uh, reasonably detailed, but it doesn't link, especially from a naval standpoint, the operations on the ground to tactics. So you don't really get a sense of how the procedure uh, of landing works. It's uh, abstracted. So my preference is a type of central front uh, system where you've got four kilometers to the hex, and this was used uh, in the 1980s uh, in a commercial war game um, in uh, four or five parts. It was five parts that uh, uh, depicted the entire uh, West German, East German uh, border uh, from the north to the south. And it incorporated um, down to company level units and measured the impact of friction as well as attrition on the units and what, what impact that had on their uh, momentum. So this is, this is my, my preference, which is to use the Panzer Blitz level system, which is deduced from the MBT system, and then uh, you generalize up to a, a central front uh, level uh, interaction of company and battalion level, which is what I think is appropriate um, for Taiwan. Now, to simulate the naval aspect and the air aspect of the conflict, uh, I think command is probably best. 